ladies and gentlemen. Right. The Wrath of Khan was released in 1982. I was only six, so I wasn't even allowed to go and see it. It's a 12 certificate, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite, quite one of the more violent for his time movies as Star Trek. But Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, changed Star Trek forever. What we see now in Star Trek is based purely on Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. The motion picture nearly killed the Star Trek franchise. We had explorers in the TV series and the motion picture, but in Star Trek II, all of a sudden we had warriors. We had a more nautical feel, it became more militaristic. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to introduce you to one of the key people behind the Star Trek movie franchise. Not only the director of The Wrath of Khan and The Undiscovered Country, uh, but also writing the screenplay for Voyage Home. As far as I'm concerned, please welcome on stage the man who saved Star Trek, Mr. Nicholas Meyer. With Star Trek, the motion picture is very, it was very, it was plodding along. It was more of a, uh, sort of like a brainiac type movie. It would, the fans wanted more action with Star Trek. The French film director, Robert Bresson said, my job is not to find out what the public want and give it to them. My job, is to make the public want what I want. When I got involved in Star Trek, I didn't know much about it. I'm no one to criticize the first movie, because surely they went where no man has gone before. And I could form impressions about what I did or didn't want to do on the basis of the risk-taking that was taken by other people. What I loved about Star Trek when I was first exposed to it, which was not when I saw it on TV because I didn't, but when they showed me the movie and showed me some of the episodes, and I was reminded of a series of English novels that I read as a kid about Captain Hornblower who was a Napoleonic-era uh, English uh, Royal Navy sea captain. And I thought, well, this is Hornblower in outer space. And so the entire sort of nautical influence to which you referred descended from that idea. I can't remember your question. <laughs> It was not only the nautical film, I mean, we actually felt like you're on the submarine. It was very much, um, if I say it was very similar to Das Boot. Very similar to Das Boot, the German film. Yeah, where they, they ripped me off. You was in <laughs> All the Nazis <laughs> ripped me off. You felt enclosed, it was claustrophobic. It was supposed to feel claustrophobic. I never understood. Is, is there a tremendous echo here? Can you hear what I'm saying? I'm um, I never properly understood why the interior of the Enterprise resembled a Holiday Inn. Um, and I didn't get um, why they were in pajamas. There was a lot of things I didn't understand. So in trying to recast the... the uh, the world of Star Trek in, in my own imagination, which I was free to do because no one was stopping me. Um, I did try to take everything and make it more claustrophobic. Um, I think Mr. Roddenberry always felt that the, that the Federation, that the Starfleet was sort of like the Coast Guard. I thought it was more like the Navy. Um, and it was sort of clear to me that what was going on was a species of gunboat diplomacy in which somehow the, what we used to call the white men, but we'll now call the Federation, knows best. Um, 
in Star Trek VI, I carried the idea even uh, further in terms of uh, claustrophobia and sort of the nuts and bolts of where people slept and how they cooked for them and everything like that. Okay, we're going to open the Q&A session now. So has anybody got a question? Oh, there's a guy right there in the front. I I'm going to jump down. Play with me. Sorry, are you asking me if I had any instructions from Paramount? Any instructions, but also what was their you know, uh, vibe to you? Like, this is a last chance, please help us, or are we fine? Okay, simply put, um, the, the first movie, whatever one uh, thought of it, still made money. And Paramount's feeling was that they would try to make another movie. There were t-shirts that said at one point, you know, we're going to do it till we get it right, or something like that. They weren't going to throw anything like the budget of the first movie at the second, at the second film. I don't think there was at that point any thought of, quote, rescuing the franchise. Several, it certainly never occurred to me. I was just in charge of making this movie, and that's all I set out to do. What was nice about my experience, and it was a it was a wonderful experience, was that I got to work with a whole bunch of really wonderful and very nice people. I was a total stranger to it. The cast made me feel welcome, um, and I had a free hand. I just. No one was telling me what to do. That doesn't happen very often, not outside my house. Um, so it was uh, very enjoyable to sort of dream the whole thing up from scratch and say, okay, let's, let's just start over here. And I think part of the fact that I'm sort of a flat-footed person, that I always began by saying, well, why are they always doing this? How come they're in your pajamas? And why do they say negative when they mean no? And other, and does anybody ever read a book in this show, uh, in this world? Uh, I guess we all read them on Kindles now, except me. Um, but, you know, and I was just wandering around my own bookshelves when I pulled The Tale of Two Cities off the shelf and said, can't they read a book? And I picked the only book where everybody knows the first and the last lines, and that was just sort of happenstance. But there were no instructions. There was no franchise. There was no thought of that until they saw the finished film. And then it was like, are we really sure we want to kill Spock? I said, yes, I'm sure. I mean, that's what we did. They can really I think, and I was not thinking with a monetary hat on at all, as you can probably tell, because I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, a lot of people care deeply about this person. You mean this is going to be a dry hustle? And it's like, oh, no, he's not really, you know, so I was fighting that tooth and nail. But maybe I was wrong. Just to be specific, uh, what Khan is saying is not Shakespeare, it's Herman Melville, it, it's Moby Dick. Um, those are his real pecs, we have to always answer that question, those, that, that's the real him. Um, I have known JJ since I used to read him bedtime stories. I was at his bar mitzvah. Um, and he is a lovely kid, and I, I just did this Houdini mini-series in America with his dad, with whom I've been partnered for a hundred years. Having said all that, it was hard for me to understand um, the world that, the, the Star Trek world that J.J. is depicting. Um, I, I didn't think Spock goes around slugging the shit out of people. I just. I don't think that was the, the same world. Um, so it, when they say this isn't your grandfather's Star Trek, 
I'm not yet a grandfather, but I, it was hard for me to understand it. I think JJ's filmmaking uh, skills are entirely enviable, uh, and I admire them. But it was a film that was hard for me to understand in terms of the Star Trek that I knew, and maybe that just makes me old. Okay, another question? Hi, um, oh, sorry, um, I read recently in an interview you seem to have quite a good relationship with Leda Nemo, especially for developing uh, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. So I was just wondering if you had any particular memories or anecdotes about working with Leonard. Can, can somebody... Um, I heard something about Star Trek VI and a relationship, but I didn't hear with whom. Any, any particular memories about working with Leonard Nimoy? Star Trek VI uh, came about um, with a conversation between myself and Leonard Nimoy. Paramount wanted to make another film with the original cast. He asked me if I had any ideas. I never have any ideas. Um, but I went for a long walk with Leonard, and this was, I guess, around 1989 or 1990, the wall had just come down in Berlin, and uh, he said, you know, the Klingons have always been our stand-in for the Russians. I said, some of my best friends are Klingons. Anyway, uh, he said, what if the wall comes down in outer space? Who am I if I have no enemy to define me? Which I think is an interesting question. You may remember that the conservative philosopher at uh, Harvard, Francis Fukuyama, wrote an essay after the wall came down wondering, have we reached the end of history? And that became the central catalytic uh, conceit for this last Star Trek film. It was made on a very, very tight budget, tighter than any of the others in a, uh, proportionally. Um, and it's funny about the movie, watching it now, I think it's a good movie, but there's one aspect of it that does give one pause, which is that at the end of the film, Kirk says, people can be very frightened of change, as indeed we can. But the film looks somewhat smug in a way that it envisioned at the time a brave new improved world. We were no longer eyeball to eyeball with the Soviet Union with mutually assured destruction if anybody used these god-awful weapons, but is now an improvement. It's a question that must be asked, because instead of the brave new world that I think the movie was celebrating, we have a world that may not be so new and improved, where the, the nuclear bomb will be in a suitcase instead of in a missile silo. So it's as, my memories of it are sort of uh, blended, if you like, with a certain self-consciousness about the way things have turned out so far. Okay, our next question was from this lady there. Hello there. Um, before The Wrath of Khan was released, I remember reading somewhere that there had been alternative endings filmed. Never. No? So I was going to ask you what they were, but obviously they weren't. Yes, it was in a newspaper that said there'd been two. Oh, well, if it's, it, was it in a Murdoch newspaper? A British, British newspaper, so... Say no more. Yeah. <laughs> so there wasn't. Right. Thank you, that answers it. Okay, next question. We're not having many from over this side. Oh, that, that gentleman there. 
Um, what was your working relationship with Gene Roddenberry like? Um, my working relationship was very, very slight. Uh, but it's funny, you know, when you ask people about their memories of things that happened years and years ago, I would, you know, trial lawyers and policemen will tell you that eyewitnesses are the least reliable witnesses. My memory, for example, of Gene Roddenberry as it, uh, as it relates to the Wrath of Khan was that, oh yes, I was introduced to him, I met him, and that was about it. Subsequently, I was at the University of Iowa Library where my papers are collected, and I was shown an entire file of correspondence between myself and Gene Roddenberry over the screenplay that I wrote of The Wrath of Khan, in which we were arguing back and forth. If you think of the Star Trek, um, I, I hate to use the word franchise, but the Star Trek world as a, a bottle of a given shape into which different writers and directors have poured their own vintage, then I think, and a lot of writers over the years of various series and directors have, have done this. I think for some reason the vintage that I was pouring in was distasteful uh, to Gene Roddenberry. I think he had an optimist's view of human destiny and where things would go, and I did not share that view, and I think he took exception in one form or another. He took an even graver exception to Star Trek VI, where the crew of the Enterprise was depicted as bigoted in relation to the Klingon species. Um, this was very painful to him. We didn't work together during the course of making either, either of the three films that I worked on. Um, but I did have encounters with him before going to work when he reviewed the scripts of all of them. And, you know, I don't think he was happy. I think he was happier when he saw the finished films. I think he was happier with Khan and he was happier with Star Trek VI, which he, sh he saw shortly before he died. And he sort of, I was given to understand that he changed his mind when he saw the finished thing. A lot of times, when you hear about something in theory, it doesn't sound so good, or it mightn't sound so good. And then you see how it's actually done, because it's all about in the doing. That's what art is about. It's about execution, how you did it, whether you did it right. Before Spock was killed in this movie, I got threatening letters from people saying, if Spock dies, you die, and whatever. Helpful things like that. And I'd say, look, the question is not whether Spock is killed, but whether he's killed well, whether his death seems organic, part of the story, has, makes sense, has meaning. Otherwise, it, it just looks like, you know, an arbitrary thing that somebody, you know, did to get a rise out of somebody. It becomes manipulative. All art is manipulative. We, we don't want to know that we're being manipulated. And I think the reason that people accept the death of Spock is because it's part of the story. And it works. Had it, had it you know, been perceived as something else, I think people would have thrown things at the screen. But to date, no one's ever done that. Next question. Uh, right, we've got one right on the front again. Hi, I have two questions about uh, the story. The first part is, um, why didn't Khan, with a superior intellect, uh, think of checking the transporters? And the second is, uh, why did they spend all the time looking for a lifeless planet when all you need is a starship to create a sun and a planet? I'm sorry. I, I, I... <laughs> 
It was a very technical question regarding whether or not, why did Khan, with his superior intellect, not check the transporter? And the second one, uh, why, did he, why did he need a planet when all he needed was a starship? It was a technical term, that, uh, it was a technical question that probably you wouldn't have... Uh, Let me answer you in a, in a different way, if I may. Artists are not the answer to a book of math equations at the back. Artists lose all proprietary authority over their creations when they're finished. There are sort of messages that you put in a bottle and when you're finished you sort of throw them out in the world and hope somebody pops the cork and can make out what you put inside. But my opinion, my speculation, I mean, why doesn't Khan see that Kirk escapes at the end? How come Khan and Kirk never have a fight? I don't know, is the sort of long answer to this stuff. Um, you sort of do the best you can, you do what feels right at the time, and other people will pick it apart figure out all the things that don't make sense or are wrong with it. Um, so I, I can't really answer your question. The script was written very, very quickly. Uh, and I'm sure that as a consequence, there are a lot of nails that I, I didn't hit down in the somewhat rickety structure. Um, I did a movie called Time After Time, and it, other people said, well, why doesn't H.G. Wells just go backwards two days and meet the Ripper at the bottom of the stairs? Good question. I don't know. Okay, next question. Oh, we've got a few here. <coughs> just bear with me one second while I try and get to you. Hi, how are you? Hello. Uh, after the success of uh, Wrath of Khan, did Paramount approach you to direct the next movie? Yes. If you did, why did you do it? Well, I've already specified my objections to Spock's not dying when I thought that was the whole idea. And I have never understood the resurrection notion generally, so I didn't know how to do it. Sorry? What was the... If I had done the third film? I don't know. I don't get many ideas that I think are any good. You know, I just think, oh, that shit. You know, I'm very big on self-censorship. Okay, another question? I just wanted to ask you um, why it was that, I mean, it seems like you wrote um, quite a bit of the screenplay for Wrath of Khan, and I was wondering why you're uncredited. Why was you uncredited? Oh, how the screenplay of Star Trek II came to be written. Gosh, most people must know this story, but for, so forgive me, but um, I was ostensibly involved as the director of the film. And Harf Bennett, who was and remains a dear friend, was the producer. And when we met on this movie, and he said, uh, this draft number five is coming in in a couple of weeks, and I'll send it to you. I said, good. And it was about four weeks later that I woke up and said, well, whatever happened to that Star Trek project in draft five? So I called him up and he said, oh, I can't show it to you. I, I don't like it. So I said, well, what about draft four? And he said, kid, he always calls me kid. He said, kid, you don't understand. All these five drafts are simply five separate attempts to make a Star Trek movie, another Star Trek movie. They're unrelated. 
And I said, oh. And by this time, I was really stoked on my horn blower in space idea. So I said, um, well, why don't you send all five drafts up to my house? And he said, you're kidding. I said, no, no, just let me read them. So this van arrived, and I'm a slow reader. And I sat and I read all the different drafts, and then I said, why don't you come up for coffee? I, I have this idea. And so he and his partner, a man named Robert Salon, came to the house and I said, and I, and I had a, a, a legal pad, a yellow legal pad, and I said, here's my idea. Why don't we make a list of anything we like in these five drafts? It could be the plot, it could be the subplot, it could be a sequence, it could be a scene, it could be a character, it could be a line of dialogue. I don't care. Just make that list. And then I'll write a new screenplay and try to put as many of those things in as possible. What's wrong with that? Because they didn't look happy. And they said, well, the problem is that ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, says that if they don't get a screenplay in 12 days, they cannot guarantee delivery of the shots in time for the June release of the movie. I said, what, what June release of the movie? This was only the second movie I'd ever directed or proposed to direct, and I couldn't believe it. They'd already booked this thing into theaters. You have no script, and you, he goes, well, that's how and I said, well, okay, okay. So, but I think I could do this in 12 days. Um, but we have to do it now. We have to write down now what we want. And they still didn't look happy. And I said, what's the problem now? And they said, well, the problem is that we couldn't even make your deal in 12 days. And that's when I made my big mistake. I had an agent who at one time had thought of being studying to be a priest. And when I told him this story, he knew he could never have been a priest because he tried to kill me. I said, forget about the credit, forget about the deal, forget about the money. We're just talking about the writing now. Because if we don't do this now, there's not going to be a movie. So they looked at each other and they said, well, okay. So we picked, Kirk meets his son, we picked the Genesis thing, we picked Khan, we picked um, Lieutenant Savick, we picked uh, a simulator sequence which was in draft three on page 50 and Spock wasn't in it. And we just grabbed things and then I just sat down and it was like fiddling with a Rubik's Cube non-stop for 12 days and what came out came out, you know, for better or worse. And that was the script. And basically the dialogue is all mine but the other things came from all those five people who had created stuff that I could never have thought, you know, I'm not a sci-fi person, so, you know, I saw the episode with Khan, and I got that, and I built on, on him, and he went into exile, and the woman went with him, and so forth, and I just built things, and as I was playing with these different story elements, the themes and ideas of the movie, and what it was about, became clear to me, and I started writing into those ideas, which is friendship, old age, death. Those, for better or worse, is, is, is what, I, what I thought the movie is about, not what I'm telling you it's about, because I don't have that authority. But what, what did I intend? Yes, and that's how it came to be, and that's why I don't have a credit on it. Unfortunately, Ladies and gentlemen, that's actually all we've got time for. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nicholas Meyer.